Amen. So keep your place there in 1 Kings chapter 19. We're going to go other places and then come back to the story in 1 Kings chapter 19. So this morning, um, we are going to be continuing kind of our personal development summer that we're going on here. And we're going to talk about um, something this morning that I guarantee applies to every single person in the room, every single person listening to this sermon. What I want to talk about this morning and look at from the Bible this morning is a major source of of stress and anxiety and just negative feelings that people have in their lives. And that's why I think it's important that we look at what the Bible says so we can get rid of this. We're going to look at something that, that is a, a major source of personal misery that people have. So if you've ever been stressed out, anxious, depressed, just uh, feeling negative, I guarantee that this is at least part of your problem this morning, all right? The title of the sermon this morning is controlling the uncontrollable. Controlling the uncontrollable. It's where people would try to control things that they cannot control. And when you try to control things that you can't control, this is where you get stressed out, depressed, anxious. People, some people live in a constant state of anxiety because of this very reason that they are trying to control things that are simply not under their control. You say, well, why can't I control these things? Why can't I control all these different things? Because I'm going to show you from the Bible this morning that you are not supposed to be able to control everything. You are not supposed to be able to control. Not everything is under the realm of your personal control. And that is something that you need to realize and you need to be able to live with. And that's what I'm going to show you this morning. The Bible is very clear on this subject. I'm going to give you four areas this morning. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. I'm going to give you four areas this morning to focus on and think about this morning on areas that there are situations, people, beliefs, different things where you cannot control what is going to happen and you need to realize that you cannot control the uncontrollable. All right, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. You're keeping your place in 1 Kings chapter 19. We're going to go back to that great story in 1 Kings chapter number 19 in just a few minutes. But I want to give you four areas this morning, areas that people get stressed out about. Areas that people get stressed out they get anxious, they get depressed because they are trying to gain control of something that not only they cannot control, but God does not give you the authority to control in those areas. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, 7, and verse number 10. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter number 7, and look at verse number 10. The first category of places where people try to control the uncontrollable is with people, is with people themselves, with other people, all right? And in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse number 10, I'm going to give you the most intimate example of, you know, a situation where you can simply not control other people. The Bible here is talking about marriage. It's talking about a husband and a wife. Look at verse number 10. It says, And unto the married I command, yet not I but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. Verse number 11, but and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband and let not the husband put away his wife. So this is teaching against divorce and it's saying, look, if you do get divorced, you can't get remarried. Jesus taught the exact same thing, but the Bible is saying don't get divorced. You know, don't put away your husband, don't put away um, your wife. But to the rest I speak, I, not the Lord, if any brother hath a wife that believeth not. Now, Paul gives some specific advice here on somebody. Now, look, you should never be in this situation. You should never end up in a situation where you marry somebody that is unsaved. However, this is, so for all the young people that are not married yet, don't marry somebody that's not saved. There you go, all right? But this is a very common situation. It is a very common situation where you find two people that are married and one person is not saved and the other person is saved. They're literally unequally yoked. The Bible says don't be unequally yoked. So I love the Bible because the Bible not only gives you direction on things to do, but it tells you like what to do if you don't listen to the Bible. So it's saying like if you don't listen to the Bible, 
here's plan B. Here's plan C, here's plan D, here's plan E. The Bible always has, you know, an extra plan. It's not like if you didn't listen to plan A, you're done, and we have nothing else to say to you. But look, people end up married to unsaved people for multiple different reasons. First of all, people get saved later in life. You know, people have somebody, you know, two people that are unsaved, that are married, have somebody knock on their door, somebody gives them the gospel, one of them gets saved. And then maybe the other one just doesn't, doesn't accept the gospel, is just not going to believe. That's the case. So this is, I mean, it is shocking how common this is, actually, where you find somebody that is saved and somebody that is not saved, and they are married. And the Bible here, Paul, is saying, stay married. Don't, you know, be like, oh, my, my wife is unsaved. I'm going to put her away. I'm going to get divorced, all right? It says, if a brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. Meaning, if she stays there. So already you're starting to see the point here. It says, if a, a brother, if a man is married to a woman, look, and, and we give the, the example gets given both ways. But in this case, it's saying if a man is saved and is married to someone who is unsaved, and she be pleased to dwell with him. What does that mean? What if she not be pleased to dwell with him? And she just leaves. Well, like, can he do anything about that? There's nothing he can do about that. So the Bible here is already implying that like, she has free will. If she doesn't mind that he's saved and she wants to stay there, then what should he do? Right? It says, if a woman that, you know, let him not put her away. He's saying if she does not want to leave and she wants to stay married and she's doing that right thing, don't get divorced. Don't be like, oh, she's unsaved. I'm getting, you know, divorced. I, I preached her the gospel, and she didn't accept it the first time, so I'm going to divorce my wife. The Bible is saying, do not do that. It says, for, look at this, the unbelieving husband is sanctified. Oh, and it gives the other way around. It says that if the woman hath a husband that believeth not, and he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. I like how the Bible always has to, like, flip it and just tell you each way. Otherwise, people would just make up these weird rules on like, well, it says you have to do that, not me. But he gives both examples here. So you have a wife that's saved, you have a husband that's saved, you have a wife that's unsaved and a husband that's unsaved. We see both sides of the coin here, all right? It says that the woman has a husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, again, let her not leave him, all right? So the Bible is saying if you have some people that are unequally yoked, not ideal, young people don't do that, but it's saying don't get divorced for that reason. All right? And then it tells you why. I mean, God doesn't even have to tell us why, but he tells us why as well. And it says why. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now they are holy. That is such a great verse right there. So first of all, it's saying why. Well, for the, well for, because the unsaved will be sanctified by the saved. What does that mean? Do you know how many couples in this situation that I have seen where like 10 years later, the wife gets saved? Or many years later, the husband gets saved? Why? Because he was sanctified by the wife. Or she was sanctified by the husband. All right? Eventually, they, they could accept the gospel. Eventually, they end up getting saved. But also, it says, for the sake of the children. It is obviously better if they stay married for the sake of of the children because divorce is destruction upon children period and I, mean, I know that there's this worldly teaching from the world out there that's like oh it's better that they, they, they get divorced than then the children live in a house where their their parents aren't madly in love with each other or something it's 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 ridiculous it's wrong it's a lie from the pit of hell it is better it is horrible for children and anybody that knows children, or maybe you grew up with divorced parents or whatever, you know it's terrible. It's a terrible thing. It's so bad for children that even parents, I've met many parents 20, 30 years later after they got divorced, will tell you that I wish I wouldn't have gotten divorced for my kids' sake. Because it was so hard on the kids. So that's what the Bible is teaching here. Look at verse 15. But if the unbelieving depart, now, now it's like, now it's like, okay, the husband that is unbelieving or the wife that is unbelieving doesn't want to stay. 
Now it gives us that example. Now like, what do I do there? So like literally every case is covered here. If the unbelieving depart, let him depart. And it's either case, we can say, as we saw in the verses above. And it says a brother or sister, now it's, it's showing either case, is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. Now let me just say this for a second, all right? The Bible here is saying if I am saved and my wife is not, I should, quit, I should not use myself as an example. If someone is saved and their wife is not or a, a wife is saved and her husband is not, if that person, if the unsaved leaves, you know what the Bible is saying here? That's not something you can control. That's not something that is up to you. It's saying, let them depart. Now, let me give a little, uh, a little disclaimer here. I've met many people. I've met some people, not many, thank goodness. I've met some people that get divorced, and you talk to them about, you know, or they tell you that, you know, of course, of course, I, I've met some men that have been divorced that, of course, it had nothing to do with them. It was not any part of their fault at all, which is completely false in every case. But I've met some men who's like, yeah, she was, she was an unsaved, wicked person. So let them depart or whatever. So, which there is cases where, like, two people are saved and then, you know, obviously they're not happy with each other when they get divorced. And then it's like she was never saved or he was never saved or whatever. That's not what this is talking about, okay? This is talking about somebody who's just, who's really not saved and leaves the saved person. That's not, that's not on them. Just let them leave. It doesn't mean they can go get remarried. It's just saying, you know, that's not something you can control. Honestly, if you're a man and your wife just wants to leave you and go to something else, or a, a husband wants to leave his wife, look, this happens all the time. That is a horrible situation for the person that is being left, whether it be the husband or a wife. But there's, there's little you can do if that person is going to, is, is decided that they're leaving. All right, look at verse number 16. It says, but God hath called us to what, though? At the end of that verse 15. God hath called us to peace. All right, fighting and strife and trying to control that person and trying to get that person to do something that they're not going to do is not peace. That is the opposite of peace. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or what knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? So it's saying God's called us to peace, meaning... God is saying if, if a, a husband is saved and a wife is not, there should still be peace there. It shouldn't be trying to control that situation, verse, you know, vice versa. Um, it, it's clearly not an ideal situation. But the Bible is saying just, you know, just think of a situation where you have a husband that's not doing the right thing in a marriage. You have a husband that's turned to Ephesians chapter 5. Let me give you a, a more specific example on this. But the Bible is teaching in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 that you can only control what is under your control. And the Bible is telling you what is under your control. Look at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 25. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 25. Let's, let me give you a specific example. The Bible is very clear in Ephesians 5 20, 22, I'm sorry, in Ephesians 5 22, it says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as the Christ even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. So this isn't popular today, but it is very clear that God wants the man, he has ordained the man to be in charge of the home. He is in charge of his wife and his children. But let's say you have a husband that is not doing the right thing. You have a husband that, you know, that is not doing the right thing and, you know, you just have a wife that's just trying to control him and get him to do, maybe she's right. Maybe she's not, but maybe she is. But what is she doing? She's trying to control him. The point is, the Bible is saying, is teaching us in 1 Corinthians 7 and also in Ephesians chapter 5, that's not going to work. The Bible is saying, if it's not in your scope of control, don't try to control it. Just be in what? Be in peace. Be at peace. Try to do your best to sanctify 
your husband. Turn to Proverbs chapter number 21. Let me just show you that in the case of a husband, let's say, and I'm going to give the, this extreme example here. In the case of a husband married to a wife, well, just, let's just say they're both saved. But let's say that the husband's not doing the right thing. He's not wanting to go to church and wanting to be that spiritual leader. A wife can do two things. She can either just sanctify her husband through her proper godly actions, or she can step in and try to put herself in that role and try to control that situation. And in that case, she's going to have stress and anxiety, and it's not going to work anyway. Look at Proverbs chapter 21 and verse number 9. Look, there's only, there's, I want to show you that in that case, in this example of a husband that's not doing the right thing and a wife that is saved and wants to do the right thing, there is no win for her to try to control her husband. There's no win there. There's no way to win. Because in one case, in Proverbs 21, verse number 9, I mean, I'll just give you two cases. Like, she could either fail at controlling him or she could succeed at controlling him. Look, have you, have you ever met a man that's controlled by his wife? I've met, it many t met that man many times. So she could fail or she, she could succeed, but there's no win for her there either way. Look at Proverbs 21, verse number 9. First of all, she could fail. This is the fail verse right here. It says, it's better to dwell in the corner of a housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. Proverbs 21, 19 says, it's better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and angry woman. Why is she contentious and angry? Well, she's trying to control the situation. She's trying to come in and tell him the way it's going to be. Look, maybe she's right, maybe she's not, but it's not her situation to control. So what happens? She fails and he leaves. He goes to the corner of the house. He goes to the garage. He just doesn't want to be around the situation. That's an epic fail right there. She's not controlling anything. She's literally driving him away. And the Bible is saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 that she should try to sanctify him through peace. Not be contentious and angry. And let me ask you something. Is this woman happy? In Proverbs 21, is the woman happy? No, she's mad. She's angry. She's contentious. She's stressed out. Look, if you're for the woman, you would not be telling her to do this. Because she's not living a happy life here. Both parties are losing here. Both parties. But what if she succeeds? You ever seen a woman that's in complete control of her husband? You ever seen a woman that just, she, she's in complete control, she's the boss, she just, she berates him, she tells him exactly what to do? Let me tell you something. This woman resents him. This woman, she has succeeded in gaining control, but she resents him for it. And if you can picture this woman in your mind, which I'm sure we can all picture this woman, she's not happy. She can't stand him. She can't stand. Subconsciously, she's thinking to herself, why do I have to be the one in charge? Why can't you take care of those things? So look, even wives that succeed in this, they aren't happy. There's no win for them there. My wife, a couple days ago, my wife showed me this video. And, and she never does this, but it must have come up on her feet or something. She showed me this video. Of, it, was this, it was this video of an air, on an airplane. And there was a, a man, his wife, and then this young guy that was sitting next to them at the window seat on this three, three row on an airplane. And this woman, somebody, one passenger was recording this whole event. But it was just this, this short-haired, angry woman. And she's just berating this young man. She's just berating him, just yelling at him, because he's like wearing like a MAGA hat or something. So he's like a Trump guy, and she's just like, you don't even believe in gravity, and she's just berating this guy. Like, he's, you know, just, I mean, to the point where, like, they're kicking her off the plane. And her husband is just sitting next to her just like, and he's just like this whipped dog sitting next to this woman who's getting them both kicked off the plane by the way. And I'm just looking at this guy and just like, you pitiful human being. You know, and then finally he pipes up 
to the, the law enforcement officer uh, that, that's in the situation at that point. And he's like, if she quiets down, can we stay, he says. And it's like, he doesn't know who's going to quiet her down because it's not going to be him, apparently, obviously. But, I mean, my point is, this woman was miserable, is my point. This was not a happy woman. She's just completely lost her mind because somebody had a certain t-shirt on. This is not a happy person, but she had him under control, that's for sure. So look, the point is, trying to control something that is in not in your scope to control, there's no win there at all, all right? You can only really control yourself, even, even in a marriage, all right? See, that's how you actually lead as a man in a marriage is by controlling what you do. By leading by what? Leading by example. You're the example. You control yourself and other people should follow you. But the Bible's saying dwell in peace. Don't try to, clo don't try to control these things that are not in your scope to control, all right? So look, you don't have control over other people. That's the first point here, all right? And look, this is a lesson that, you know, I've learned that, you know, especially becoming a pastor and preaching, this is a valuable lesson even for me as a pastor and for every pastor. Every pastor needs to understand this lesson that I don't have control over you. In this church, I stand up here and I tell you what the Bible says and I preach the Bible. And look, I, I have control over the management of what happens in this church. But I do not have control over what happens in your house. I don't have control what happens when you leave here, if you listen to the sermon or not. I remember just starting, you know, just starting preaching and just, just having that feeling like this, because you would see, you would preach things and people would just completely not listen. And people would just like, people would have problems in their lives on things that I literally just preached like three weeks ago. And they're having these problems. And I'm just like, you know, the biggest problem for me was I was like, I didn't feel like I had to go control those people, but I was just like, is this just a waste of time? Like, I spent hours and hours and hours writing sermons every single week. Is it, am I just completely wasting my time? And the answer is, like, I know now that I'm not wasting my time because, number one, not everybody doesn't listen. But the real answer is this. If you don't listen to the Word of God, that is not my responsibility. That is not my responsibility if you take preaching and just goes in one ear and out the other. That's not on me. What's on me is if I don't tell you. So if the watchman does not sound the alarm, then it's on the watchman. But if I told you and you didn't listen, I'm out. And I'm pretty good at that. Turn to 1 Peter chapter number 5. 1 Peter chapter number 5. Look, pastors, this is why you see pastors get stressed out. This is why you see pastors like quite frankly, preach crazy stuff. Like, you'll see pastors that, like, preach crazy stuff. Like, this is where, this is my opinion, but this is where I believe the repent of your sin stuff came from. This is where I believe the lordship salvation stuff came from. Look, it, it came from the same feelings, the same attitude as infant, where infant baptism came from. Why? Because if I control salvation, I, you know, I can control people. If I could control your children's salvation, all I have to do is change the gospel a little bit. Look, it's better than just standing up here preaching and having nobody listen to me. No, it's not better. But this is where I believe that that, it, that temptation is there. I've heard Baptist, independent, fundamental Baptist pastors stand up and say things like, if you don't... If you don't come down to the altar call after this sermon, I wonder if you're even saved. Th that's dangerous territory right there. Because what that is, is the pastor trying to control the actions of the people by like threatening their salvation or something like that. It's just completely wrong. The Bible teaches against it. Look at ver verse uh, number one of 1 Peter chapter five. It says, the elders which are among you I exhort who am also an elder and the witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Now here's a command to the pastor, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint though. You know what that means? The Bible here is saying feed, don't force, 
The Bible is saying it's, it's my job to feed you, not to force you to do something. So pastors that get into this type of attitude, they just need to step back and be like, hey, it's, it's not, I'm not here to try to control you because that's not my scope. That's not my wheelhouse. My job is to feed you, but not by constraint. Not by constraint. You know, that's why, you know, but that's where all of workspace salvation came from, was just this attitude to want to control people through their salvation. But that, that control, it, it doesn't exist. It's trying to control the uncontrollable because it simply doesn't exist. A pastor, a church does not have the power to control your salvation. It's just not there, right? Look at verse number three. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. What's the best way? What's the best way that I can convince you, that I can persuade you to listen to the preaching? What's the best way? The best way is the same way you lead your family. If you're having to lead your family, if you're having to lead your family by constraint, there's a problem. The best way to lead people is by example. The best way to lead people is to make sure that as a pastor, as a father, you're doing what? You're being an example. So people can look at you and say, you know what? I know that the, that was a hard sermon that was just preached. That was, uh, you know, these are some hard doctrines. These are going to mean some major changes need to happen in my life. But I can look at the pastor and I can say, well, he made those changes. And his family's following him through those changes. And I see his children. And I see his example of a Christian life. Look, and no pastor's perfect. I'm not standing up here saying I'm a perfect example of the Christian life. But look, a pastor should be an example because that's the most effective way to lead. It is the most godly way to lead the church by being that example of those standards, of those doctrines. I mean, I'm trying to persuade you that what the Bible says will work in your life. I am supposed to be that personal example to you. And again, not perfect, no perfect marriage here, no perfect children here, but a pastor should be that. that that's how the pastor is supposed to lead is what the Bible says, not by constraint. It is not my responsibility to constrain you. And pastors need to realize that. And look, it's something I had to learn when I first started preaching as a satellite leader. I had to learn that, you know what, it's not a waste of time to preach sermons. It's not a waste of time to write these sermons. Whether people listen or not, I did not waste my time. Because it's my job to feed it to you. And if you take it and chew it up and spit it out, I don't want you to do that. Well, that's on you, not on me. The next one is this. Turn back to 1 Kings chapter number 19. So look, you simply can't control other people, folks. It's not your responsibility. Other people are going to do things that you don't want them to do. Other people are going to do things that you know is wrong. And it's simply not your scope to control those other people. Look at 1 Kings chapter 19. So 1 Kings chapter 19 is a great story in the Bible. Many people focus on the, the chapter before because that's where Elijah just had these huge wins. He had this huge showdown with the prophets of Baal. There was hundreds and hundreds of prophets. I think there was like 800 some prophets. There was 400 of Baal and then another 450 of the prophets of the grove. So there was like almost a thousand prophets that he has this great showdown with. And of course, their God doesn't show up because their God's fake. And God comes and does this great miracle, and then he slays all the prophets of the false gods. But look at 1 Kings chapter 19, and look at verse number 1. The wind doesn't last that long, and things start getting bad for Elijah. It says, And Ahab told Je Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and withal how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent me messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. She basically says, I'm coming after you and I'm going to kill you. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness 
and came and sat down under a juniper tree and requested for himself that he might die and said, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father. So picture this situation. He just comes off this big win. He's this huge hero. He just represented God in front of the entire nation, slew all the false prophets, and all of a sudden he is running for his life. He runs to this city, drops his servant off, and then he runs literally into the woods. He runs into the wilderness just trying to get away. I mean, she clearly has many people coming after him to kill him here. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. So he literally asked God at this point. He's so stressed out at this point. He literally asked God, Just kill me. Just take my life away. And this angel comes, and he looked, and behold, there was a cake bacon on coals and a cruise of water in his hand, in his head, at his head, sorry. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. Verse 7, the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink, and when the strength of that meat, 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. So he continues running. So this angel, God gives him some, some reprieve here. This angel gives him food and water, and he keeps running for another 40 days and 40 nights. This seems like a quick story, but this was not a quick event in Elijah's life. This is something that is going on for weeks and weeks and weeks. He is running, 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 trying to escape. Look at verse number 9. He came thither into a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. So now God, the angel tells him to go stand. Um, God wants to show you something. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rock before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. Now, I've heard a lot preached on this situation right here with Elijah. But basically, Elijah gets up to this point. He's up on this mountain. The angel tells him, look, God wants to show you something. And he sees this crazy wind tear this mountain apart. He sees this earthquake break this mountain in pieces. And then he sees this huge fire upon this mountain. But God was in none of those things. And here's the point. The point in applying it to this sermon is situations happen. Earthquakes come. Wind comes, fire comes, situations happen. I mean, things happen, and it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, God caused all those things to happen. Life happens. Things in life happen. In your life, things are going to happen. You cannot control every situation in your life. If you think you can, you're going to be a very stressed out individual. You're going to be somebody that's depressed, has a lot of anxiety, because you simply cannot control everything that happens to you. You can't control people that are outside of your wheelhouse, and you certainly can't control things that happen to you in your life. I used to have, um, I remember, I was the kind of person, when I, especially when I was in my 20s, where I, would pl I, I thought I had all the plants. And I had everything planned out to the last detail. And I'll just give you a small example of how this never worked out. I had a very hard time when I was in my, my, uh, my early 20s into maybe probably my mid-20s of, of having a budget that worked. And it's like I could just never get my budget to just work out every month. And it was just... Hopefully you hear this, and, and this is like kind of a rookie mistake. You're like, rookie mistake. Well, I was in my early 20s. And it's like every single month, the budget was busted on something. And I'm like, oh, man, the, the car or the, the whatever. I mean, all these things happen. But here's what I realized. I realized my budget was just simply too optimistic. Because I realized that every single month is going to be something. Every single month. I realized that I need to build that in because I can't control all these things that are happening. I just can't control every single, and that's just some small financial thing. But look, there's major things. There's fires, earthquake, wind, all these different things. And look, those things just happen. And what Elijah needed to realize is the same thing that we need to realize 
as Christians is the more effective you get in your Christian life, the bigger target you are going to be for Satan and all the people that are working for Satan. I mean, Elijah made himself a huge target. And this wicked woman working under the power of Satan was, she was going to take him down because of the win that he brought forth for the Lord. So, I mean, I guess you could say, I could just retreat from this Christian life and, and try to, like, hide in a hole somewhere and never do anything for the Lord, but that's no answer. Or we could just realize that, hey, situations are going to happen. And those situations are not under our control. Look, I mean, definitely keep your distance from wicked people as much as you possibly can. That's why the Bible teaches separation and all that. But look, as far as trouble goes, just expect it. Just expect it everywhere in your life. Build it into the budget. Build it into the budget. As with people, you simply cannot control every situation. And I'm going to show you with the next example that if you get yourself in a situation where you think you can control everything and then things get out of control, you lose the ability to function going forward. This is the problem. Because a person that's stressed out, that's anxious, that's depressed, you know what they're not doing? They're not figuring out the best way forward. That's what they're not doing. Here's another one that you can't control. So you can't control people. You can't control situations. Here's another one that you can't control. The government. You can't control the government. I mean, you can go out and you can vote and you can do that and put your little, you know, little drop of, you know, your little raindrop in the, in the swimming pool or whatever it is. And, and I'm not against that at all. But you have to realize that you just can't control it. And look, a lot of people get their lives derailed because they get, I mean, they just get stressed out, anxious, and, and just completely triggered by everything that goes on, especially in this state. You know, I mean, people get, you know, they're like, you can't have a straw in a restaurant unless you ask for it, because that's what I do with my straws, is I take them all from the restaurant and I throw them in the ocean. It's ridiculous. But it doesn't ruin my life. It doesn't wreck my life. That's why, you know, I was just talking uh, Wednesday night with a couple guys in the church. That's why, that's why what I want to happen as far as policies go is usually quite different than what actually does happen as far as policies and all the things that get enacted. But here's the thing. I mean, it just shows you the foolishness of those that reject the Bible, uh, a lot of these policies, first of all. I mean... But the point is this, that's why in like a lot of my conversations, and some of the guys, that, the guys that have been at the church for a long time, they know this. But you probably need to understand this about me because a lot of my conversations, and I'll like give a pretext to sometimes when I'm talking about something, I'll say like, look, this is not what I want to happen. But I'm just talking about like what's going to happen because of this. Because a lot of people will hear me talking about things. We were talking about um, diesel regulations on uh, Wednesday night after church. And I'm just, I was just fascinated with it, but I'm fascinated with it, not because I agree with it, but I'm like, what is this gonna make things look like in five years? But many people cannot get to that point because they get completely triggered by the, the initial policy of it, and they lose what? They lose the ability to think. They lose the ability to be able to linear, linear you know, put linear thoughts together and come out with a conclusion on what this is going to look like in five years, what this is going to look like in 10 years. It's not what I think it should be, but what's it actually going to be is what I'm after. Because here's the thing, folks. You know, but you end up with people that they get so triggered and they get so upset over, you know, whatever this regulation or the other regulation or whatever, they get so stressed out, they, just, they can't think, and they're like, I have to leave the state. They, they just they lose the ability to function. But my point is this. It's a huge miss for a Christian to not be able to think this way. Because guess what? Unlike other people, we know things. We know things, and we kind of can see where certain things are going to go. We can kind of see, you know, things that other people, they don't know. 
So to be able to get so triggered and try to think you can control something like the government or, you know, what they do in Sacramento, I mean, it's like, you know, what a waste. What a waste. Instead, we could sit here and we could put our knowledge of the Bible. We can look at our knowledge of what happened to other nations, what's going to end up happening, and just like literally be able to think and literally be able to like position our families and position ourselves to be able to deal with what we know is coming. It's a huge miss. It's, a hu it's something that a lot of people, a lot of Christians, a lot of conservatives are just leaving on the table, this ability. Instead, they just get, they get so triggered and they just lose the ability to think at all. Because look, when you're, when you're mad and you're stressed out and you're depressed and you're angry, you're not thinking about anything. You're just overwhelmed with emotion. And what are you really doing? You're just you're trying to control the uncontrollable is what you're doing. You just need to realize like, hey, I cannot control this. This doesn't trigger me. At least I can see where it's going to lead. And those are the conversations that is love happening. Look, we're in, we're, you could say what you want about where things are going in this country, where things are going in this state, but we're not living in boring times, I'll tell you that. I mean, there's interesting things going on, which leads me to my last point. And my last point is this, on things that you can control and things that you can't control, where you, people try to control the uncontrollable, is in peop other people's beliefs, specifically when it comes to religion. I mean, you have somebody that, I mean, look, we were just out soul winning yesterday, and we ran into, um, we ran into, turn to, uh, John, turn to John 3.36, if you don't have it memorized. John 14.6 says this, Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. John 3.36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, but he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. So we ran into some Mormons yesterday, and they had no interest in hearing the gospel. Zero. Now, is this a problem? Yeah, this is a problem. Like, this is a major problem. Because the wrath of God abides on these two people. It is, it is like the problem. It's not just a problem. It is the problem. But guess what? It is not my problem. And to be a soul winner, I mean, it's a major problem. It's just not my major problem. To be a soul winner, you need to kind of have this weird balance. You need to have this balance where you really have to care about people to be a good soul winner. You really have to care and really have to want people to, to hear the gospel and accept the gospel. <clears throat> it's something you should have in your heart. But you also kind of have to be okay, or you have to understand at least, that it is not your responsibility to make people believe. Now, again, when I was in my early 20s, and my wife can attest to this, I had a really hard time with maybe even mid-20s. Maybe I'm being a little, uh, making myself holier than, than, you know, than, I, than I should. But when I, was even, when I was in my 20s, I had a really hard time. I wasn't even saved. But I had a really hard time with people that didn't believe like me. Like, there were certain things that I was really passionate about. Like, I, re I mean, like, abortion was the number one thing. Like, if you were not pro-life, you, you were the worst person ever. It was like, you just want to, I mean, oh, like, I still feel that way. Like, if you just, like, think it's okay to murder babies. Like, but it would trigger me. Trigger me. Like, one time, like, we were arguing abortion at this dinner table like after a softball game with one of the guys on my softball team and he was like pro-choice and I was pro-life and I'm just like, let's just go fight. We'll figure it out. Seriously, that's what I said. I was like, let's just go fight it out and we'll see who's right. I would have been right. But like everyone's like, oh, what? What? But I would just get triggered on issues like that. But like, here's the thing. It's not my responsibility if somebody is not going to accept the gospel. If somebody has, you know, look, I think it's sad. I think it's sad that somebody believes a false religion. I think it's sad, but it's not my responsibility. Here's the thing. Even if we could argue and we could force our belief of the Bible on somebody else, it doesn't work anyway. 
It's kind of a catch-22 because we must be okay with free will because it is free will. It takes free will to be able to accept and trust Jesus Christ. But the down, like Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 7, the downside of free will is that many people, most people, the broad way, will choose to not trust Jesus Christ. But we have to understand that that's just the truth of the world that we live in. Our responsibility is to tell them or to offer to tell them. And if they reject that, that, that is as far as it, it goes for us. It's sad. It's sad. I don't want to see people reject the gospel, especially when you find really nice, sincere people and they just don't have the time for it. That's a very sad situation to me. But forcing or arguing or trying to control that uncontrollable free will of someone else is not in our scope. And it will just cause us stress and anxiety and anger. Just imagine if you're just angry. Can you believe that guy? As you knock the next door? It's not going to work. Because what if that next door is somebody that wanted to hear the gospel and wanted to hear, and here's this angry person at their door. It's something that you need to balance. You need to be okay with free will, knowing that many will choose freely to not accept, not trust Jesus Christ. Okay, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. So just to wrap things up, just to wrap things up this morning, trying to control things that aren't yours to control, it really comes down to this. It really comes down to, if you're the type of person that wants to control things that are not in your scope, not in your wheelhouse to control, it really comes down to meddling. It really comes down to somebody who's just meddling in things that are not theirs to meddle in. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. Oh, but I just want to help. No, that's, but that's called meddling, though. If it's not your wheelhouse, not your responsibility, that's what the Bible calls meddling. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and look at verse number 11. This is interesting. It says, And that ye study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your hands as we commanded you. Ironically, here's what you will find. Here's what you will find. And I, and I like this phrase in this verse where it says, and to do your own business. What you will find with people that just get triggered by things by situations, by people, by the government that they can't control, what you will find with those types of people is most times those people, and it's totally ironic, but they do not have things that they should be controlling under control. Right. You will find things, you will find people that are worried about all those things to the point where they are, they are not functional people, where they're worried about all the things that aren't theirs to control and they have nothing that God has told them to control under control. Amen. Notice how it says, and to do your own business. That is your control, yourself. Get yourself, your things in order. That's why I love talking about the things we talk about. I'm like, all right, these things are going on. These things are happening. How's that going to affect our business? How's that going to affect, uh, literally affect your business. I mean, I literally asked that very question on Wednesday night to one of the guys in the church. I'm like, hey, how's this going to affect your business? And I knew that he would know the details about it because he's someone that does his own business. He's someone that pays attention to his own business. And look, turn to Proverbs uh, chapter. So basically, if you have this problem, the Bible's telling you in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, worry about your own business and, you know, get to work. Get to work with your own hands. Those two pieces of advice right there, just worrying about yourself, the things that you do have control over, and then getting to work. Because guess what? If you get to work, you're not going to have a lot of time to worry about other people's business. If you're actually working and taking care of the things that God wants you to take care of, that God commands you to take care of, you're not going to have a lot of time to worry about other people's business. I mean, if you're a homeschooling mom that's actually homeschooling, actually doing a good job, you're not going to have time to get into all the stuff on, you know, the internet or whatever it is that people get into. People that do get into those things, they're not taking care of their own business. Get to work and you won't have to worry about it. Look at Proverbs chapter number 26. 
Proverbs chapter number 26 is the verse of the week. Look at the front of your bulletin or Proverbs 26, 17. The Bible says, He that passeth by and meddleth with strife belonging not to him is like one that taketh a dog by the ears. It's like somebody that just walks by and is just looking for trouble when they should just be worrying about themselves. Proverbs 20, verse number 3. The Bible says, It's an honor for a man to cease from strife but every fool will be meddling. Look, it's a foolish thing. It's a foolish thing to try to control things that you have no responsibility to control. I mean, you have to ask yourself, like, why would anyone do that? Why would anyone do that? I mean, people that don't worry about their own business, they don't worry about, this is so popular today, that's such a common way of thinking today. This is why, like, victimology is so popular. This is why all these, you know, uh, these, these wicked ideologies like feminism and like, oh, you're, you're a woman, so everyone's keeping you down. And everyone, you can't, you know, do anything because, you know, men are keeping you down or whatever. Can someone tell me what women can't do today that, that men can do today? Like, what is it that, you know, what is it that's keeping, I mean, it just, it sells. It sells because everybody wants to meddle in everything else. Nobody wants to look at their own business. Nobody wants to look at what they're actually responsible for. They want to just blame somebody else. They want to, it's because of racism or it's because of, you know, sexism or whatever ism you want to come up with. That's why I'm, no, maybe you should just take care of your own business and try to control the things that are actually within your control, which guess what is yourself, is what it comes down to. The things that God has given you to control are your actions, your family, your children. All you really need to do is are those things in order. If you see all kinds of situations and crazy people and wicked stuff going on, all you have to do is be like, how is this going to affect my family, my children, my, you know, my situation, my business? That's all you need to worry about. You are not responsible for everything that everybody believes, everybody does outside of your scope. And look, if you, can, if you can perfect that way of thinking, you're going to be a lot less stressed out. You're going to be a much happier person. Because not only can you not control those things that are uncontrollable, like it's not possible. It's not possible to win even if you do gain control in a couple places where you're not supposed to have it. You're still going to be miserable. But the point is, it's not your responsibility to do it. All you have to do is worry about yourself and those things that God has put under your control. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.